It's time for Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, inviting the atheist, agnostic, and skeptic to examine for themselves the evidence for the Christian faith. We are all limited by what we do not know and by the things we think we know but are not true. Dr. Joe Mott earned his Ph.D. at LSU and was a distinguished math professor at Florida State University for 38 years, helping to write three math textbooks and authoring over 30 research articles in math. He is now the host of this radio program, Defending and Commending the Faith. Here is Joe Mott. Hello to everyone. Welcome to the program. Today I wish to discuss the National Study of Youth and Religion and highlight its findings. This study is the largest and most detailed study ever undertaken regarding the religious preferences of American teenagers. The book, Soul Searching, by Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist Denton, records the findings of the study. Smith and Denton interviewed 267 American teenagers from 45 different American states with varying religious experiences. Their book offers an analysis of the answers these teenagers gave to survey questions regarding their own spirituality and religious allegiances. Soul searching has been described as a bombshell and one that was long overdue. It shows that religion is indeed a significant factor in the lives of many American teenagers. But the book also reveals some surprising observations. For example, instead of finding hostility toward religion, we meet young people who echo their parents' religiosity to an astonishing degree. But this, as it turns out, is hardly a formula for vibrant faith. In chapter 4 of the book, Soul Searching, entitled God, Religion, Whatever, Smith and Denton venture a general thesis about the teenager's overall commitment. The authors describe for those interviewed what appears to be a major transformation of faith away from the historical religious traditions and toward a new and quite different unifying faith. Smith and Denton suggest that the de facto dominant religion among contemporary U.S. teenagers is what they call moralistic, therapeutic deism. What does this new religion look like? The authors give five general tenets that describes the creed of this new religion of the American teenagers. One, a God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life on earth. Remember, these teenagers generally identify themselves as Christian. Two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Four, God does not have to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Five, good people go to heaven when they die. Regarding number one, the word order includes moral order, the source of the word moralistic in the title Smith and Denton give. Regarding number two, Teens think that all religions basically teach the same thing to be good and nice and fair. I doubt that American teenagers know very much about other religions. So this is an assumption that the teens have made. Regarding number three, the central goal is to be happy and feel good about oneself. Before you judge young people for thinking this way, Remember that this is what they have been taught. For example, 
The kid in school who bullies other students, the school tells him that he does that because he has low self-esteem. The person who is promiscuous is told he or she has low self-esteem. The person who underperforms in school, the reason offered is because he has low self-esteem. In other words, everybody who has a problem in school is because they don't feel good about themselves and they are not happy. Ultimately, if you want to fix your problems, you need to feel good about yourselves and be happy. So it makes sense to the teenager that the central goal of life is about being happy and feeling good about oneself. Regarding number four, where did the teenagers learn that God does not have to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem? Let me point out, less than 1% of Christian families have regular family devotions and spiritual discussions. So teens likely grow up in homes that say they are Christian But in their homes, they never worship together, never discuss what the Bible says about any issue, never call upon God together unless the wheels fall off and something bad happens. And then the family gets together and prays. What do the children learn from this approach? Well, they learn that God does not have to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And the teens learn that there are things that rate higher with their parents than spirituality because parents clearly prioritize homework and sports over spirituality. Regarding number five, The U.S. teenagers agree with all other world religions contrary to what Christianity teaches. All other religions teach that people can earn salvation by being good. The moralistic uh, therapeutic deism is about belief in a particular kind of God, one who exists, created the world, and defines our general moral order, but not one who is personally involved in one's affairs. In his book, Worldviews in Conflict, the philosopher Ronald Nash says, the most important element of any worldview is what it says or does not say about God. This book puts American religious communities on notice. If religion matters, then we had better stop merely exposing young people to faith and start training them to understand what their faith means. That must include more than a few sermons or lessons on topics of theology, but requiring them to grapple strategically with opposing ideas so that they can be prepared to defend Christianity against opponents to their faith. Smith's and Denton's calling this deistic God that teenagers claim to believe in is a bit puzzling to me. The traditional definition of deism is that after creating the universe, The deistic God never again becomes involved in the world at all. This deistic creator God is like an absentee landlord who built the house but never returns to make repairs. To say that this God can resolve problems is confusing because the deistic God doesn't get involved in the universe anymore after creation. Thus, a deistic creator God cannot resolve a present-day problem. I suspect the teenagers have stolen the idea of a God who resolves problems from the theistic God of Christianity and Judaism. But the God of Christianity and Judaism is definitely not anything like a deistic God because the God of the Bible loves others, performs miracles in the world, 
in order to authenticate the message from God's messengers. The God of the Bible, Yahweh, is known as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. Smith and Denton write on page 119 of their book, Perhaps the most widespread and persistent stereotype about teenagers in American culture is that they are intractably rebellious. In U.S. culture, the very idea of teenagers and rebellion are virtually synonymous. But Smith and Denton add, but that impression is fundamentally wrong. American teenagers are exceedingly conventional in their religious identity and practices. Very few are restless, alienated, or rebellious. Rather, the majority of U.S. teenagers seem basically content to follow the faith of their families with little questioning. The popular images of storm and stress Generation Gap and Teen Rebellion may describe the religious orientations and experiences of most teenagers of a prior generation, but they do not accurately portray the religious realities of most teenagers in the United States today. But here is a troubling fact about teenagers in American culture. Most teens know remote details about television characters and pop stars, but are quite vague about the biblical characters of Moses and Jesus. They are well versed about the dangers of drunk driving, AIDS, and drugs, but many haven't a clue about Christian traditions, core doctrines, and Christian distinctives. The teens know very little about the nature of the God of Christianity. The Christian worldview centers upon the majestic person and work of the sovereign God revealed in the Bible. This eternal and morally perfect divine being, the one God in essence, is nonetheless triune in nature. God is first revealed in the scriptures of the Old Testament. The same God made a dynamic and decisive revelation in the historical person of Jesus Christ, who, according to the Gospel of John, fully explained God. God's triune nature, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and the person and nature of the Holy Spirit are critical realities in understanding the distinctive Christian faith. The unique attributes of the biblical God distinguishes him from the gods of other religious worldview perspectives. For a deeper analysis about God, see Louis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology or Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. Yet, the American teenagers seem to be ignorant of these fundamental realities and what scripture teaches about God. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and you will find rest for your souls. That's found in Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. In verse 28, the rest that Jesus gives refers to the gift of salvation. The Holy Spirit enters our fallen spirit, and spiritual reproduction ensues, and we become a child of God. The rest that we find when we take on the yoke of Jesus and learn from Jesus refers to the saving of the soul as we experience fellowship with him and his people as we grow in the knowledge of him and his word. Jesus is still giving salvation today. His word is still available today for us to grow thereby. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That's in John chapter 10, verse 30. 
So God and Jesus have the same nature. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. That's in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. So we can expect the character of the activity of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit to have the same type of character as that of Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is no reason to attribute to God the curses of Satan. God is not responsible for putting evil on people to teach them a lesson. That's all due to Satan. Don't be confused about that cop-out. Allow me to end this episode by reminding you to exercise daily. Walk with God. Thank you for listening to Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott a production of Wave 94 Radio in Tallahassee, Florida. If you have any questions or comments for Joe, please forward them to Doug Apple at Wave 94 at this email address, dougapple at wave94.com. And be sure to join us every Monday evening at 6.45 p.m. on Wave 94 and subscribe through your favorite podcast app, Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott.